science is in a, an interesting period right now. It's, it's actually got to a stage where it's moving at a, a, a truly incredible rate. I mean, never before do I remember day-to-day -day discoveries. Week-to-week -week was something, month-to-month -month was pretty average, but day-to-day -day now, science is changing. Scientists say there's nothing that, that we're working on that seems to follow the rules and the laws that we were dealing with yesterday. New things are coming. So even the most notable researchers and scientists and writers in the mainstream front, front line are, are now sounding more like science fiction writers used to. And their work and their discoveries is in fact seeming a little preposterous to that breed of people whose, whose vision is constrained perhaps by what they perceive to be the limits of plausible achievement. The people who feel that it was all learned done and dusted with passing that last exam. We, we've just um, been celebrating, or celebrating, and maybe that's the right or the wrong word, but we, we just passed the 50th anniversary of the uh, DNA discoveries by Crick and Watson. Ever since that time, ever since the 1950s, and in fact since the days of Albert Einstein himself, physicists have been searching for something which they define as the holy grail of physics. The holy grail being the, the ultimate quest, the ultimate relic of, of something that they're looking for. And they, they've never known quite what it was, but they know that it's there. This is a, a famous picture by Salvador Dali uh, that was produced at the time to actually commemorate the DNA discoveries at that time. And it, it was a, an unusual picture. It got a lot of very strange press at the time, because not only was Dali a, a surrealist himself, but he actually now had subject matter that was surrealistic. Who could portray this? How, how, how did one show DNA? What did it look like? So, so this is the, the, um, the picture. What scientists have been looking for, in essence, is a sort of universal, unified theory of everything. They've reached the stage in, in the last a um, few years where they, they seem to know now that the biggest, biggest questions of all will be answered by the smallest, smallest substances. And they're looking at atoms, and then they're looking at nuclei, and then they're looking at quarks and protons, and uh, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and every time they get more and more excited because they make more and more big discoveries. Scientists of various sorts have established now, they, they've, they've informed us that matter, any matter, can be in two places at the same time. They now know that particles that are millions of light years apart, somewhere up, up in space, can be connected. They can cause a situation where they talk to each other through light years of space with no seeming physical connection at all. Space-time can now be manipulated, bent, crumpled, um, teleportation, they say, is becoming a reality. Gravity-resistant material is now headed, heralded for air transport, certainly uh, for, for spacecraft. And everything now that they're talking about seems to be in the realms of hyperdimensional environments. Parallel universes, they call them. Dimensions beyond the space-time that we live in and are familiar with and understand. So we're going to be looking at all of this in a fairly strategic way, and we're going to be looking in particular at doing it by virtue of a particular substance which is called an orbitally rearranged monatomic element. Now it looks as simple as that. It looks just like a, a little white powder that, that on the face of it could be anything. That particular powder not so long ago was a sliver cut from a 24 carat Canadian maple leaf gold coin. So that gold powder is nothing but the atoms of gold. It's called asymmetrically deformed high spin. It's a high spin element because the way that the nucleus um, is shaped and the way that the electrons spin around it changes. And it, it's gold in a very shocked and frightened state that, that simply says, I, I don't know what I am anymore. I'll just fall apart. It would be the same whether it was atoms of platinum or any of those metals that are, that are classified as noble, transition group metals, the science call them. The interesting thing about it 
is that within the space of time that it takes to transform a piece of gold into that, we move through analysis in a situation where here it tests as gold, here it doesn't matter what analysis you use, you can use spectroscopy, neutron activation, chemical analysis, whatever you like, it won't tell you it's gold. It is not gold anymore. It's a very strange and unique form of silica now. And this has um, caused a lot of interest in the scientific world. They've actually established now that, that those things which are the prize valuable metals are actually constructed of atoms that aren't metal. The only thing that is metallic are the bonds, the little gluons that hold the atoms together and form the solid. And once they've gone, the metal goes, the colour changes, the colour just disappears. This material has become enormously important. It's become important in, in terms of the medical industry, it's become important in terms of the power generative industry, it's become important in, in, in terms of fuel, um, and, and therefore it moves from the operating table of, of the local hospital into the spacecraft um, somewhere up there. This is a material of, of great magic. In today's world, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin in Texas has described these materials as exotic matter. It can think of no better way to explain them. They're exotic. They conform to no rules uh, and that they're not like anything else they've ever known. They are not on the periodic table of elements. Science has never known about them until the last few years. Nano is a word that you'll be seeing a lot of. It is a form of measurement, it's a new measurement, and it simply means one millionth of a millimeter. Minuscule proportion, and this is where they're making the biggest discoveries about the universe. When Lost Secrets of the Sacred Ark was um, first published, and that was ten months ago, there were scientists claiming then that there was no such thing as monatomic gold. Well, that was their view then. These are some of the things that we get in today's scientific press. There is masses of this information. All about monatomic gold, about nanowires made from monatomic elements, and about their uses in, 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 in various forms of technology. How important they are, how they can communicate with each other, how they resonate with DNA how they will contain and attract energy. It can't reconfigure itself as metal. What it actually is, is little strings of atoms, like the top picture there. They're called clusters or micro-clusters. Scientists are calling these wires now. They're really like DNA strands. They group together in little clusters, like the bottom part of the picture, and form these little clusters. So what we're seeing in the powder that we were just looking at, every grain of that powder is one of these clusters at the bottom. Little groupings of, of single atoms just hooked together, but not by anything metallic. The reason that these scientists hadn't heard about it a few months ago was that they weren't the scientists that were working on it. Scientists now are incredibly busy, busier than they've ever been before. They are so wrapped up in what they're doing and their new daily discoveries that the physicist in this room here wouldn't have a clue what the chemist is doing in his room down the corridor. Neither of them would know what the botanist is doing in the office across the road. So when these things come to them from other areas, um, they're surprised. It's new to them. The silly thing is that it doesn't take a lot to understand that whatever you're researching now in any of these fields, you have to keep abreast of what's going on in the other. You know, I make the point very often that even a, a little leaping insect, which is biology, knows that it's, it's got to jump, which is physics, to feed, chemistry, on another plant, which is botany. So, you know, even, even the insect knows that, that the link between the sciences is very important. They are now developing machines on a tiny, tiny, tiniest of scales. This one here, this um, is an ant. If you can imagine the size of an ant, just, just think about how small an ant is and whether you've ever even seen an ant's mandibles. Well, this guy, he's carrying a computer in his mandibles. 
this is is astonishing stuff. This photograph was taken at Huddersfield University in England. Um, that computer is far more powerful uh, as a device than anything that you've ever used. And that picture was taken three years ago. They are now 100 times more powerful and 10 times smaller than that. To put these into perspective, when Cornell announced their latest one some months ago, um, this, this was the scenario that was given to us, just to put their power into perspective. In 1993, 10 years ago, Intel's most powerful microprocessor had 3.1 million transistors on a single chip. Today, their equivalent best has 40 million transistors on a chip. So in 10 years, they've moved from 3 million to 40 million. These things, these kind of devices, multiply that by 100, even now, to an astonishing 4,000 million transistors on a single silicon chip. And it is all so small that they do this on something a million times thinner than a human hair. It's that small. Computers that you can bunch up and fit within the full stop at the end of a sentence. The amazing thing about these monatomic elements is that they're not actually a new discovery. We seem to have caught up with them again, but we seem to know about them a long, long time ago. We can go back to some very ancient texts. We can go back to Egypt. We can go back to Mesopotamia. We can go back even to the Bible itself and find lots and lots of ancient references to magical powders which actually seem to do all of the things that scientists are now telling us that these are capable of. It called um, these powders which were associated gold in, in Mesopotamia, they were called shamana. In um, Egypt, they were called Mufkut, so they had all these strange names. The Alexandrians called it the Paradise Stone. It's not a stone, it's a powder, but they called it the Paradise Stone. And in all cases, whether it was Shimana, Mufkut, Paradise Stone, or whatever, they all said this is a mysterious powder of projection. A powder of projection, and, and the various cultures were unanimous on that particular description. They said it has powers of levitation, powers of transmutation, of teleportation. It seemed to be a vehicle uh, by which they would communicate with gods. It was something to do with the afterlife of, of the Egyptian pharaohs. And they also said it was a key to active longevity. Because of this, people were able to live a long time, particularly those whose life it was part of, the high priests, the kings, the pharaohs. The Egyptian pyramid texts, they talk about the material, it's called Mufkut. The pyramid texts come from the 5th dynasty tomb at Saqqara of, of King Unas. Here is described something called the field of Mufkuts, and this is interesting because this moves into modern science again, the field of Mufkuts. This material was meant to have a field around it or about it or that it was associated with that was very magical and very powerful and was the field in which the pharaohs would communicate with the gods. It was the field that determined their final gateway to the afterlife. The stories of this field turn up earlier than the 4th 5th dynasty. They turn up in the 4th dynasty. They turn up in the 3rd and the 2nd. And it's very interesting that we've never discovered the bodies of any of those old kingdom pharaohs. We've discovered what we think might be their tombs, but we've never discovered their bodies or their mummies, uh, those that we've got are from a much later time. Somehow or other, they seem to have vanished into thin air. And the texts tell us they were sent into the field of Mufkuts. Intriguing. This is a, a portion of an old Egyptian temple. There's an interesting story behind this temple. The anniversary of its discovery, the 100th anniversary, is next year. It was discovered in 1904, but it was not discovered in Egypt. Back in 1904, the Egyptian Egy Egyptologist, uh, Flinders Petrie, British archaeologist, went on an expedition into the land of Sinai um, to 
map the country for the Egypt Exploration Fund. And that was the land apparently where Moses had taken the Israelites and they'd crossed this land of Sinai to get from Egypt into the Promised Land. And en route there, they'd stopped at this amazing mountain. And this was the mountain where Moses saw the burning bush. It was where he received the Ten Commandments and the Book of the Law. It was where he seemingly spoke with God and where they built the Ark of the Covenant. And this whole story is full of, 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 of accounts of fires and all sorts of amazing magical things going on. Anyway, they decided to climb this mountain. They climbed it. Two and a half thousand feet above ground level, they found a great plateau with this temple. An Egyptian temple in the middle of nowhere. 270 feet of it on this plateau. Another equal amount of it back inside a cave that was carved into the mountain. This thing was very important. At the time, they didn't know what they were looking for. They didn't know what they'd found, but they found a, a secreted hoard of pure, unadulterated white powder which they said they winnowed and they sieved and they tested. There was nothing there, no residue of anything, just this amazing powder, which he said would disappear into your fingerprints. It was so fine. It seemed to have been an operative workshop, he said, more, more of a place of work than worship. The whole thing was dedicated, it seems, to Mufkut and the production of Mufkut. Every pharaoh from the 4th dynasty to the 19th dynasty was portrayed there. Every pharaoh had stated things that were written on tablets in this mountain. So these wall reliefs depict going through the pharaohs of numerous dynasties strange presentations. This is an example of one. This is drawn up by the Egypt Exploration Fund, this particular one from a relief. This is Pharaoh Amenhotep III. This is an 18th dynasty pharaoh, and the caption, and the, these are all captioned in hieroglyphs, it says, Shebek Hotep brings the noble and precious stone to his majesty. He is the guardian who brings the bread, because he is the great one over the house of gold. So we have this, and we have this fellow here called Shebek Hotep, uh, a treasurer fellow who's holding in the middle of the picture this cone-shaped object. So the association is there, and there are numerous of these. And once that had been discovered in this Sinai temple, the moment Egyptologists went back into Egypt and began to look, they've kept finding these. Mufkut, cones, bread, light. It was about bread. It was about something the kings ingested. They were eating this material that was formed into little cakes, but it was a powder. The Old Testament book of Exodus gives us a, a really good example of this in operation. Uh, it took the longest time before anybody even thought to ask a question about this little bit of the story in Exodus. Many of you will know the story. Moses had been up the mountain. He'd come down with the Ten Commandments and then he broke the tablets because he got terribly angry to see that his brother Aaron had collected all the gold earrings from the Israelites and melted them down and made a golden calf as an idol of worship. And he said, well, that may, may be the way we used to do things. We don't do that anymore. We have this new culture here that we're part of, and I've just spoken to the Lord of this culture, and we don't worship graven images anymore. And he got very angry. And then it says this, that he took the golden calf, he burns it with fire, he transposed it with powder, mixed that with water, and fed it to the Israelites. Interesting little story. He took the gold, burnt it with fire, and transposed it into powder. That doesn't work. You, you heat gold with fire, or burn gold with fire, you get molten gold. You don't get powder. Nobody, it seems, thought to ask the question. They use this, it says, to make bread. They could mix it with frankincense, the Bible tells us, and mould little bread cakes, which the ancient, the most ancient Bible text that we have, the Septuagint, the, the old Greek Bible, calls bread of the presence, presumably bread of the presence of God or, or of something important. Shemana means firestone. This is a relief from that temple, another relief showing a bread presentation again. It was always linked with bread. They were always little conical shapes. We know that from about 2,500 BC, 
the pharaohs in Egypt, or the kings before they became pharaohs in Greek times, um, were ingesting the bread cakes of this white powder substance. Only the metallurgical adepts knew the secret of its manufacture. Metallurgical adepts, yep, it's made from metal, that makes sense. The high priest of the temples had a very strange title. The high priests of the Egyptian temples were called the great artificers. Well, a great artificer is, a, is a, 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 a worker in materials, particularly metals. So that was sort of interesting. It's beginning to link together. And thinking back to Petri's concept, yeah, these were places of workship, not worship. Temples were not the same as churches, but evolved from the concept. I actually looked in just the English language word etymological dictionary from Oxford University that traces the origin of words. And lo and behold, I only had to go back 700 years to discover that the word we now use as worship had a K in the middle of it. It was workship. They used to work for the gods. They didn't used to worship the gods. They used to work for the gods, whoever the gods were. It was said that this was the food of the light body. They said we all have bodies, but we don't just have physical bodies, we have light bodies. And just as we feed our physical bodies, they said, we have to feed our light bodies so that they will be nurtured and grow in, in the same way. They have to be as fulfilled as the physical body. And they call the light body the car. Well, it's interesting because scientists in recent times have actually called this material the light of life because it resonates with DNA on the same frequencies. It's a light wave. We find lots of references to Mufkas. Um, this relief here, this picture, uh, this drawing was actually done by the, the, the uh, Russian scholar Emmanuel Velikovsky. And he drew this up simply to give us an image of, of this relief at Karnak, at the Temple of Karnak. That sh this shows the treasures of, of the Pharaoh Tutmosis, the um, third. Mufkut in e Egyptian law was always portrayed as a cone shape. Now these things sit there in the gold section. Um, and it says underneath, these are gold, but we call them bread. 1450 BC, roughly, Tuthmosis founded uh, uh, at this temple at Karnak a, a college, an institute at the temple of, of, of scholarly, priestly types who were called the Great White Brotherhood. The Alexandrians wrote of them and said they were called the Great White Brotherhood because they were absolutely obsessed with a mysterious white powder. And they made some interesting comments. They said that they call it the Paradise Stone, and it has unique qualities in as much as that it can weigh far more than its own original quantity of gold. But even a feather can tip the scales against it. So it can be a lot heavier than the gold it came from, or it can be lighter than a feather. This stuff has the ability to change its weight very, very dramatically. It's always in the old text associated with light, with enlightenment, with illumination of some sort. It's, it's a light illumination that seems to have to do with the acquisition of knowledge and wisdom, that, that sort of illumination and enlightenment. They're activating bits of our system now with this material that never seemed to have any purpose before. Why? Do we only use a fraction of our brain power? Why don't we use the rest? Well, it's there to be used if we knew what to do with it. We need the trigger. We need the unlocking device. These materials are it. They're what was used to feed the car, the light body, to, to give anti-aging, to, to restore the youth, to take the pharaohs into the afterlife or whatever. There's an institute in um, Switzerland called the Alpha Learning Institute. The chief research director there is a fellow called Sean Adam. Sean Adam for 10 years has been the world's memory and speed reading champion. He can read a 300 book in 24 minutes. He reads at a speed of 3,850 words a minute. Uh, not only can he do all of that, he remembers it all and he can be tested on anything. He's also got 
He's joint holder of the sixth highest IQ ever recorded. So th this guy has, has been running with others this research institute for the longest time, which is linked up to government and corporate institutions. And they specialize in learning difficulties, in behavioral patterns and behavioral difficulties. Any, anything that, that might be linked to behavioral science uh, uh, along to finding cures for dyslexia, ADHD, learning deficiencies, you know, things of that sort. And they're the primary institute in the world for fronting these things. Well, from October 2002 until January 2003, as a, uh, a little three to four month period there, they decided to test monatomic elements. Ten volunteers, five male, five female, average age somewhere between 17 and 52, and they were fed um, simply orally with these materials, with uh, monatomic elements, these powders, regularly and irregularly, just to test the reaction. Well, the results were, in their words, staggering. Sean Adam, he wrote, what we are seeing here is really quite amazing. The tests show it to be highly effective. The effect is immediate and cumulative. What they do here is, is to work on brainwave patterns and they try to synchronize uh, these things and they found that this material could do it. The theory and the logic behind it is that the better balancing between left and right brain produces, and these are their words, a greater intelligence, enhanced creativity, improved mind-body coordination, more agility and less stress. Well, okay, that makes sense. If we're operating as we should be, that's what we should have. But we're none of us really operating as we should be. We're operating with all of this left brain uh, thing going and not too much of the right. Well, here are the charts here. These are just average charts. There are hundreds and hundreds of these. They took everybody's brainwave scans as they were, they were going along. Now, the top chart sh shows a, a normal starting base where, in effect, and this would be any one of us at any moment in time, the brain waves coming off the left side were far outweighing those, the red ones, on the, the right-hand side of the brain. The effects, they say, is immediate and cumulative. At the bottom is the first immediate effect. What happens is that the left has now contracted back to meet the right, and, they both, and the right's grown just a little bit, but they've absolutely synchronized. The left and the right brain of this person, and this is the immediate effect, has now begun. And then they say it's cumulative, because what then happens is that it all grows to where the blue one was at the beginning. Quite extraordinary. Our research clearly shows that the left-right brain imbalances predominate in many mental behavioral dysfunctions, such as dyslexia and ADHD. It is our professional opinion that the monatomic products would be of tremendous benefit in any of these conditions. It is the most obvious answer as a healthy alternative to chemicals that have harmful side effects. To that, Sean Adam, the director, adds, if I were going to take an exam, mental or physical, I would take monatomic elements immediately beforehand. The worst that could happen is that there would be a little improvement. There could be a lot. What about somebody who's permanently doing this, getting those into balance and growing with it? This is exactly what the old text told us that these things would do. They made them into bread cakes. They fed them to the priests. They fed them to the pharaohs. It gave them longevity. It gave them extra creativity. It enhanced their perception. It enhanced their intuition. It enhanced their awareness. All the qualities of leadership came from the Mufkut, from the Shimana, from these golden cakes that they called bread. It's clear from the evidence of all these ancient things that it didn't matter what they called things. It didn't matter that they didn't understand perhaps the true science that we're beginning to understand now. What they did know is that it worked. It did certain things. And they told us about that. So even if they didn't understand it, they presented things as sort of communicating with gods and, and, and priests who were able to disappear before their very eyes and things. But these are all things that this enables to be done now. In Greek mythology, it was the one substance that sat right at the very heart of the golden fleece legend. It was what the quest was all about. 
the secrets of, of manufacture of this material. It's linked up with the Ark of the Covenant, that famous golden coffer that Moses had built at the uh, mountain in Sinai and took to Jerusalem where the temple was constructed to house it. So this most valuable artifact, the Ark of the Covenant, was entirely tied up with this science in some way, as we shall see. Mysterious processes concerning gold and things automatically ring alchemy bells. Pictures of, of, of wonderful wizened old chaps in, in medieval times with all sorts of potions and fires and things burning away, all trying to perfect this thing called the Philosopher's Stone, which Harry Potter has reminded us of yet again. It was in the middle 1600s, 1660, uh, that Britain's Royal Society was founded and established and chartered by King Charles II. And it was that establishment of, of that society that, that, that embodied and led to the great discoveries of people like Christopher Wren, of Edmund Halley, of Isaac Newton, Robert Boyle, uh, and, and all of these tremendous characters that emerged in the, in the 1660s and 70s uh, to make scientific discoveries that had never been made before. And most of those were made on the back of the fact that they were pursuing alchemy. They were searching for the Philosopher's Stone, and during the course of it, they made lots of other discoveries. Just like today, in space research, we get for our households all sorts of other wonderful spin-offs. The discoveries of things like gravity and whatever were spin-offs from looking for the Philosopher's Stone. There was one particular fellow, um, classified today as an alchemist, although he, he was simply called a philosopher at the time. He was truly revered as a great master by the Newtons and others of the day. This fellow was called Arrhenius Philalethes. And for Arrhenius Philalethes was reckoned to be the ultimate master in that period. And Philalethes had got a little bit fed up with the church propaganda about the Philosopher's Stone being some silly device to turn base elements into gold and whatever. And he thought he'd published material and put the record straight in the public domain. So in 1667 in Amsterdam, he had a work published called Secrets Revealed. And in this, he discussed the Philosopher's Stone, its nature, its qualities, what they knew about it. But most important, he made this point. Our stone is nothing but gold. Our stone is nothing but gold. It's gold digested to the highest degree of purity and subtle fixation. We call it a stone only because of its fixed nature, because it resists the action of fire as successfully as, as any stone. In species, it's more pure than any gold that it comes from. But its appearance is that of a very fine white powder. That was the Philosopher's Stone straight from the hand of the most famous chemist, alchemist of his time. We go back 200 years, we go back to the 15th century, we, we can look at the last testament of Nicholas Flamel, probably the best known of, of all the great alchemists of all time, uh, a fellow who spent 20 years from a very poor base studying his science and ended up probably as the greatest and wealthiest benefactor that France has ever known. He made the point on the 22nd of November 1416 when writing his last testament, exactly the same. Our stone is gold, but it's perfectly prepared gold. It's a fine powder of gold. That is our philosopher's stone. So we have a whole new perspective here. We have a perspective that says the philosopher's stone, despite all the propaganda, despite all the church has done to try and make it look silly, is not about turning anything into gold. It is gold. It's gold in the highest possible purest form that it ever could be. And that white powder that we looked at earlier was exactly that. That was 24 karat gold. What's the gold that the Philosopher's Stone makes? The great enlightenment. Not the great enlightenment of money and wealth and riches and a lump of gold. The great enlightenment of wisdom and learning and intuition. That's the real Holy Grail. That's, that's the true enlightenment. We can leap forward in time now and see how these old stories match up with what's been going on. And it begins right here in the United States, it begins in 1976, and it begins um, in Phoenix, Arizona. 
a very, very apt place, actually, because the word phoenix was Old Phoenician and it means red gold. It all began with a farmer, a cotton farmer, a third-generation cotton farmer just outside Phoenix called David Hudson. This is a picture of David Hudson as he was about five years ago. Um, he's your average American farmer. He wasn't a physicist, he wasn't a scientist, he was nothing. He certainly wasn't an alchemist. He was destined to become all of them. His father had been Commissioner of Agriculture for the state of Arizona. They were farming about 70,000 acres in the Yuma Valley there. And they were growing cotton of very, very high grade. But they had a problem with their soil. Big problem with the soil. The soil was enormously alkaline. In fact, it's a strange soil there. There's no topsoil in it. There's no real nutrient as such that's apparent. It's just eroded rock dust. That's all it is. Very strange material. Its surface becomes very black and very crunchy. To the point where, at the end of a growing season, once the crop's been picked, over the ensuing months, this stuff gets so hard that it will not be penetrated by water. Now, it's not an area where it rains a lot, but their irrigation trucks were having no use with it. And this had gone on for generations. Uh, and David thought, well, it's about time to have a look at this and to try and work out what this stuff is, because it means that we have to work in rotation and we can only plant our crops in that field every three years. What, what they did to start with was that they take this substance and they, they could see that it was a combination substance, some of which was just nasty black stuff, but within it there were these white elements that, that really seemed to show up within it, and they wanted to know what they were, because this seemed to be the thing that was the, the problem. So they, they took it into the lab, they, they, they cleaned it all up, they, they actually got this stuff out of the black material into a precipitate, and, and what they then had to do was to dry that out so that they could test it. Well, the f strangest thing was happening. They, they decided the best way to dry it was simply to take the filter papers and put them out in the sunshine, just to put them outside. The moment they did that, it exploded. Now, it hadn't been that the farmland had been exploding, but the moment they separated this material and put it in the sun, something about the heat or the light exploded it. And it was explained as if it was like a flash of 40 or 50,000 flash bulbs all going off at once. Not only that, it disappeared. They thought, well, that's, that's really strange. You know, is this an implosion or an explosion? What, what's going on here? It's like a great blast of this light. So they took an unsharpened pencil and just stood it on end uh, in the sample, in the, in the filter paper, just stood it there. Bang, white light, it's gone. The pencil's still there. It hasn't blown over. It's not been affected by this. There's no blast. So they said, OK, this needs cleverer testing than we've got. So up they go to Cornell University. Now at Cornell at that time, they, they said that they got this amazing new equipment and this equipment could test anything that you'd got down to three to five parts per billion. So they put it on their machines and they came back and they said, it's iron and silica and aluminum. And they said, well, it can't be. None of those things disappear in a blaze of white light. No, I mean, none of them have these properties. There must be more to it than that. So they, they tested them again, and, and they discovered that actually the, the reading that they were getting was, was just a little impurity at the front level. It was reaching the boiling point of these particular substances. And once they got rid of them, and they were less than 1% of the whole, once they got rid of them and tested 99% plus of the sample, they said, we can tell you exactly what you've got pure nothing. You have nothing that our machine will read. It will, not, it will not acknowledge that there's anything on there being tested. It's nothing. So they said, OK, we'll try arc emission spectroscopy. Very, very simple process. Two electrodes. The bottom one has a cup in it. You place your sample in the bottom cup. You bring the other one down and you strike an arc. That arc heats up and ionizes what's in the sample. And one by one, as it reaches the boiling temperatures of each of the constituent elements, it will read them off and tell you what's there. So if, for example, you, were, you, were, you put a, a motor car engine in there, its first reading would tell you it was water, because it was reading the cooling system. 
When the water had all boiled away, it would then tell you it was metal. So that's the way it works. So anyway, they put the stuff in there, and um, the same thing happened. They said it, it said it was iron, silica, and aluminum, and that was it. Nothing was recognizing it. it. It was not listed. It was totally unknown to science, this strange white material that would disappear from vision. Well, then the Russians came along. The Soviet Academy of Sciences. We're now in, in, into the 1980s, well into the 1980s, and the Russians said, We've been telling you guys in the West for the longest time, you really haven't got much of a clue when it comes to analysing materials. Your electrodes burn away before you can reach the boiling temperature of some of your materials. Carbon has a lower boiling temperature. These electrodes are made of carbon. They're burning away before whatever it is has heated up enough. So it's not reading it. Russians said you need to burn this in an arc for 300 seconds, not 15, which was common in the West. 300, five minutes. So they go back to base and they put the material in and it begins. Within 15 seconds, iron, silica, aluminum. They all expected that and then it, nothing. But the arc now is carrying on burning, whereas the Western style one stopped. And suddenly, at 70 seconds, it says it's palladium. After palladium, reads platinum. After that, as the various boiling temperatures were reached, came ruthenium. Rhodium, iridium, and at 220 seconds, osmium. Every one of the platinum group metals was in this substance. It was them. It just wasn't showing up at them as them in a metallic way. And in fact, when they worked out the content of these soil samples, it was discovered that per ounces of substance per tonne of soil, they had 7,500 times more platinum in every tonne of their soil than they were getting from every tonne in the best platinum mine in South Africa. But it wasn't metal. You couldn't make jewellery with it. Suddenly Hudson discovered that General Electric up in Massachusetts were looking at a new, new sort of fuel cell technology. And he said, look, I, I, I've got this stuff here, and, and it says in your literature that you're, you're using rhodium and iridium and these platinum group metals uh, for fuel cells. Your reports say that you're experiencing very strange phenomenon. You're, expecting, you're, you're, you're experiencing blazing white lights and explosions and disappearing tricks and things. And they said, yeah. And he said, well, I've got some stuff that does that. And they said, yeah, don't, don't worry about the white light explosions. We know all about those. Don't worry about the disappearing tricks, we know all about those. And he said, great, tell me all about them. And they said, no, I mean, we don't understand them, we just know about them. We know that it happens, and that's where we're leaving it. You know, we're, it happens. We, we don't want to understand it, we want to make fuel cells. Well, David wanted to understand it. It was then decided that, that since this stuff was going to be proven as a kind of material that could be used in fuel cells, they said you ought to get down to the patent office and lodge a patent on this. You know, you need to, to lodge it because somebody else could discover it and stop you from working with it. So that's what he did. And, and there's a portion in the application where you have to do tests with weights and measures. Well, the funny thing about this material was that they'd noticed that it was, its weight was fluctuating. So he, he said, well, like when? You know, at what stage do we weigh it? They said, well, you're just going to have to keep heating it and cooling it and heating it and cooling it. And seeing what the mean weight is. So they've got this machine, which is called a thermogravimetric analyzer, and they started doing this weighing. Well, it was actually quite remarkable. They managed to get readings during heating that took it to a weight of less than zero. They managed to get readings during cooling that took it to anything up to 700 times its original weight. Think of the Alexandrian Paradise Stone. These powders will outweigh the original quantity of gold. They can also be lighter than a feather. That was exactly what it was doing. But during the process, there was one particular moment, one particular moment in time where the weight fell very quickly and very dramatically at that moment, and it fell by 44% suddenly. But what they noticed was something really odd because the z less than zero weight that they were getting didn't make a lot of sense. It was sitting there in a pan in the lab on effectively weighing equipment. The pan itself weighs something. You have to compensate for it before you put the other material in it. 
But what they discovered was that, that it was reading all of these zero weights, below zero, but they thought, well, what about the pan? That should weigh something. So they tipped the material out and put the pan back, and it suddenly weighed more without the material in it than it did when it was in it. This stuff was not only levitating, it was carrying the pan with it. And they learned that this stuff has the power to give levitational qualities to its host. So they carried on and they thought, well, we've got to do these other things for the application, we've got to see if it's conductive. That was the next test they had to do, so they put wires and electrodes into it, attached them to a voltmeter, turned on the power, nothing. And then they thought, well, it's, it's got to be a conductor of some sort, because if it's capable of, of, of holding energy, you know, how are General Electric doing it? You know, it has to be conductive. Anyway, it turned out that it was a superconductor rather than a conductor. Superconductors are very, very strange animals. They don't need contacts to convey to each other. They convey to each other through resonant frequencies, through lights. The interesting thing is that, that if you transmit electricity from A to B with a wire, you always get some dispersion. You always lose some energy. With this, you lose nothing. 100% can go from there to there. No contact in between. 100% stays. It works so differently because it doesn't allow voltage potential to exist within itself. Neither does it allow any magnetic um, field to exist within itself. It's totally null. It doesn't react to North Pole, South Pole. It has its own quality, and its own quality defines all the laws. Here we have uh, a, a standard magnet. We have North and South Pole. It's the magnet we all use. It will attract metals. And in fact, even if you put above it something that it won't attract, it'll fall down onto it because gravity will just take it there. That superconductor doesn't. Well, it's nothing to do with it. Won't be attracted by it, won't particularly be repelled by it, but it's just placed there above it and it'll just stay wherever it's put. We know that its anti-gravity properties can be translated to its host. We know that the scale of that doesn't seem to matter. It's, it's macrocosm, microcosm, big, small, has nothing to do with these superconductors. So in as much as that, that tons of it were, be, were discovered at this, this Egyptian temple, dating back to the fourth dynasty at the time they were building the pyramids, and we know that this stuff was very capable of transferring its weightlessness to the pan in the lab or whatever else one might associate it with, it would be equally as capable of helping them move the most enormous stones to build pyramids which incidentally the stones themselves contain. You don't even have to get them from outside. Sandstones and limestones contain these, these elements in a natural form. And it's very interesting to, to think now that, that of all of the ways that they thought perhaps these stones were moved, none of them have ever worked in experiment or trial. This does. So they discovered that this stuff would levitate, they discovered it would disappear, they didn't quite know why or where it went to, and they knew that it was important for, for energy. They knew that if it was a superconductor it could attract energy, it could store energy and it could distribute energy. Yeah, fuel cell, that's what we're looking at here. The, the, the old stories of the powder and the Ark of the Covenant began to, to ring bells here about the, the, this potential that they had the ability with the use of this material to store and distribute enormous quantities of energy. Light waves, that's what it works through. It's been discovered now and in fact just during the last few weeks um, it, it's been discovered that even the particles that we're looking at, which are these monatomic gold clusters, when you get down to their atoms, even the atoms now aren't solid. They are not physical property, they are a gaseous substance. So it's no wonder they will levitate and, 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 and whatever, you know, there's nothing to them. But cooling will make them heavy. Two superconductors can be linked together. You, you, can, you can trigger one in oh, down here in LA, and you, you can decide to send electricity to Chicago. All you have to do is to resonance frequency the two of them together, just to get them in tune, like a couple of tuning forks or whatever. And you turn it off, and you can go away for 100 years and come back, and it will still be flowing until you decide to turn off that, that triggering mechanism. So Hudson got very, very, very excited about all this, and he went along... Uh, to the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin, and he, he met with the director there, a fellow called Hal Putoff, who, 
many of you might know or know of. And Hal Puthoff is, is famous for his studies of zero-point gravity and vacuum energy, that, that sort of thing. What Puthoff had established, he'd been working on gravity calculations by the Russian physicist Andrei Sakharov from the 60s. And he'd been working out the mathematics for this. And he'd worked out that, that matter was capable of resonating in different dimensions that, that weren't ours. But what he calculated mathematically from Sakharov's work was that the moment it begins to do that, at that moment, the moment you know it's on the change, just hooking into the beginnings of another dimension, it will automatically lose four ninths of its weight. And Hudson went along, he said, look, this is really interesting because 44% mine's losing and that's the same, it's the same figure, four ninths. And so um, they agreed, well, yeah, I mean, it's because you're now, this stuff is beginning to resonate in another dimension. That's what's happening to it. It should disappear totally, he was told, if it carries on. And he said, it does. It disappears totally. We don't know where it goes. It just disappears. So they decided to test this. And uh, they said, that, look, the way to do it is this. If you have a, a, a little pile of powder in a pan, and it becomes invisible, that means it's still there, but you can't see it. So if you've got a spatula and messed it up in the pan, it would come back, when it comes back, in a mess. Um, but we suspect that yours won't. We suspect it will come back in the same shape that it disappeared in. And that's exactly what happened. It didn't come back in a mess. It came back looking exactly like it had disappeared in that same perfect shape. There you are, they said. It's not invisible. It has simply moved out of our space-time, and it's now been brought back into it. Well, from that moment in time and around that moment in time, scientists all over the world were talking about these hyperdimensions. Um, Britain's Stephen Hawking, the famous Cambridge professor, um, Sir Martin Rees, our astrologer royal over there. It, it took a lot of people by surprise, really. They, they were saying that, that there are realms that exist around us and within our environment that we know nothing about. They called them hypersystems. They didn't know how to explain them and they were coming up with drawings of this sort, trying to explain these sort of parallel situations, but it, it didn't really work. It, it, such pictures didn't prove anything. It was demonstrated, that the, the concept of another dimension was demonstrated by cubist art, of all things. Cubist art was based on a principle of showing the dimensions that we can't see. And this, they, they had this wonderful thing which they called the Great Prismasaurus. Now, the great Prismasaurus has, is, a, is a, a, an article with millions of facets on it, but it actually has a fourth dimension for everything. Everything that you can see the outside of, you can also see the inside of. What are these um, dimensions? Well, Martin Rees explains that, that our dimension is called three-dimensional because it goes up or down or left to right or backwards and forwards. We have no objective perception of it. We just live within this realm. So there are other universes, they say. Some are crumbled up, so small that, that, that we can't even imagine them, but they're accessible. Um, others, they say, are a millimetre away from us. It's the world where Einstein's theory of then, now and the future all coming into play at once. It's looking at the 30-storey building from outside as against being in it on its 15th floor. On the 15th floor, you perceive the 15th floor. You can look out of the window and know that you're part of something bigger, but you can't see the other floors. Well, the other dimensions are, in fact, those other floors. You can move into them. You can travel up and you can travel down, but you have to know how. You have to know how to trigger it. They say that gravity, they now understand, gravity is actually a signal leaking out of one of these other dimensions into ours. It, that's where they say the power of gravity comes from. So we're in this bubble, they say. Our whole universe is a bubble wrapped inside other bubbles that are wrapped inside other bubbles. People like NASA come on the scene and they say, yeah, well, it, it will be very easy. You know, we can move things between dimensions. We're not actually doing it yet, but we know how to do it uh, because it's really a matter of, of resonance frequencies. All you have to do is to tune the locations to each other, just like setting up your radio onto a station. You know, when you get it in the right place, the message comes through. Treat it like tuning forks. Set up the vibrations between them. That way, we can send anything we want, they say. We can send 
pictures, we can send text, we can send physical matter. What we've seen over the past six or seven years now is an increasing awareness in the science press of the DNA links with these materials and how important they're becoming. They've talked about how they can be used to re-coordinate um, the uncontrolled division of body cells. This particular article here from Scientific American, the way it reads is, is this, that they place these, these elements at the end of the strands. The researchers examined the electrical properties of short lengths of double helix DNA in which there was a ruthenium atom at each end of one of the strands. Mead and Kayam, the scientists estimated from earlier studies that a short single strand of DNA ought to conduct up to 100 electrons a second. Imagine their astonishment when they measure the flow along the ruthenium-doped double helix to find that the current was up by a factor of more than 10,000 times. It was as if, they said, the double helix was behaving like a piece of molecular wire. Wow. It's our monatomic gold wires. They're able to turn the DNA into becoming a part of its structure or vice versa. The two things can become one. By this means that they build up an integrated circuit of light within the body and they have the ability to perform cell correction. DNA has memory. What does the memory do? It tells, it, it tells the DNA what it should look like. It tells the cell structure what it should be. What is cancer then? Cancer is malformed or deformed cellular structure. That's all it is. It might be horrific, but it's basically very simple. It's DNA in a muddle. How do you correct it? You make it 10,000 times more intelligent and, and the DNA says to itself, I shouldn't be like this. I'm supposed to be like this, and it changes. It will reconfigure itself correctly in accordance with the way it should be. This is cancer treatment that involves no surgery. It involves no drugs. It involves no radiation. It leaves the immune system intact. And suddenly, the light of life has become a, life, a truly life-giving substance. None of it is about being anti-cancer. This is the interesting thing. And AIDS and all of these types of disease, it's not anti-anything. It's pro-life. And the thing that, that has amazed doctors is that you can actually cure cancers by thinking about preserving life. Everything that they've done up to date has been the opposite. It's about killing cancer. And in doing that, you're destroying DNA, you're destroying body tissue, you're destroying cellular structure, you're affecting their immune system. Because the rule was that nobody said you had to have a good quality of life after the cancer had been killed. What they had to do was to kill the cancer. Well, the best cancer cure on that basis is a bullet through the head. That's killed the cancer. Well, now what, what, what they're looking at is the potential for not killing the cancer, but for giving the body back the the life resonances that it should have had. And now scientists are saying, yeah, the light body. All of this stuff connects together within us in light waves. We now know how to begin to manipulate those light waves. Yes, you can um, work in a lab and you can attach two atoms of, of gold or ruthenium or whatever to a DNA strand. How the heck do you do that in a live body? We see now that because of this, what they're working on is a very straightforward process that enables them to do exactly that. They can move into body areas with little devices such as this fellow. These, these are machines, computers, more powerful than anything you have on your desk, in your office or at home, which are capable of performing these microscopic um, little bits of surgery, for, for want of another name. They will place the atoms at the end of DNA strands. They can be devised to do just that. In fact, we could have them all the time so that we never actually got out of whack anyway because they would see it coming and correct it. Monatomic elements have anti-aging properties, we're told. They correct DNA. They interact with DNA. They are devices which can affect the 
hormonal structure of the body. This is a really interesting medical area. Each of the original metals seems to have a relationship to one or the other of the glands in our endocrinal system. Uh, gold seems to link up with the pineal gland, for example. Iridium seems to link up with the pituitary gland. These substances, whether ingested or injected or, or whatever, they can affect and heighten and enhance the hormonal secretions from any of these chosen or selected glands. It's a science which now puts paid to the problems associated with hormone replacement therapy, for example. Um, you know, it's, it's a therapy which, which is very popular. It works to an extent. It has some funny side effects. But in the end, all, all they're really doing is, is, is dosing human beings up with the hormones from the desiccated glands of dead animals. Well, there's not a lot of point in that. Far better if they can find a way to, to make more of our own. So why not enhance the pineal gland to produce more melatonin? Why not enhance the pituitary gland to produce more serotonin? So that's the area that they're moving into now, and these, these materials will do exactly that. In today's world, uh, the Institute for Advanced Studies in Austin in Texas has described these materials as exotic matter. It can think of no better way to explain them. They're exotic. They conform to no rules, uh, and that they're not like anything else they've ever known. They are not on the periodic table of elements. Science has never known about them until the last few years. The Center for Advanced Study in, in Illinois um, classifies superconductivity, which is one of their main attributes, as the most remarkable property in the universe. So we've got something pretty amazing here. We've got a, a very ordinary looking white powder, which is exotic beyond any comparison, and contains abilities which are the most remarkable properties in the universe. And yet, it appears like um, some grains maybe of talcum powder. So we sort of move towards rounding up here. Manipulation of space-time has been something they've been talking about for about the last five to seven years. A fellow here called Miguel Alcibuer. Uh, he's a Mexican mathematical scientist uh, involved with the Max Planck Institute in Germany. Uh, was working at the time in 1994. Uh, for the University of Wales over in Britain. This is the abstract at the beginning of a, uh, a multi-page document that he wrote, the journal Classical and Quantum Gravity, which caused quite a stir worldwide. He didn't pose any questions. He didn't say that this is what we're researching. He began his article with, we now know. In fact, the abstract reads, it is now known that it's possible to modify space-time in a way that allows a spaceship to travel at an arbitrarily large speed by a purely local expansion of the space-time behind the ship and an opposite contraction in front of it. A motion faster than the speed of light, reminiscent of the warp drive of science fiction. Well, we're back to the sort of questions that we have with the DNA and the strands. How do we solve our space travel problems? We know that, that people's lives can't last long enough to, to get to the distant stars. We know that m our machinery and metals can't. We know that the fuel runs out. We know that these things are inordinate distances away. How do we deal with it? We deal with it laterally, as Alcabuer suggests. We think about it differently. We forget about the spacecraft. What do we do? We look at the spacecraft, we look at the million light years that it has to travel, and we know that that's impossible. So why don't we just take the million light years and put it behind the spacecraft? Why don't we think about that? Why not move the space-time instead of the craft, so that with zero propulsion and no time having gone by, it can move through a million light years because you've simply screwed that up, tossed it behind it, opened it up again, and it says, it is now possible to modify space-time. Well, yes, it is. He was absolutely correct. It is now possible. This was followed in a series of related articles, American Scientist, an um, article written by the physicist Michael Spear, um, he showed that this had nothing to do with violating Einstein's theory, the theory that nothing can travel faster than light. 
it didn't violate that at all because nothing would be traveling anywhere. It would be staying still. Space-time would be moving. The acceleration rate, he said, would be enormous in theory, but there wouldn't actually be any. The true acceleration would be zero. Fuel consumption, zero. Time taken, zero. Distance traveled, million light years, maybe. So the question was raised, okay, it's possible, how is it possible? What's the device that makes it possible? And the answer came back loud and clear, exotic matter will be needed to generate distortions of space-time. The next question that went back was, what is exotic matter? Exotic matter, here's the description, it has the curious property of having a negative energy density, unlike normal matter that we're familiar with that makes up the people and the planets and the stars, which has positive energy density. The necessary exotic device is an operative superconductor. And in fact, the list of what exotic matter is, is the same list of every attribute that applied from the research tests on monatomic superconductive elements. They're the only substance ever to have been classified as exotic matter. What's needed to generate distortions in space-time? Exotic matter. What does bending space-time mean? It means the ability to move from one dimension into another, what did this stuff prove that it can do? Move from one dimension into another and be brought back again. This is uh, NASA's rather unattractive picture of what they call now their warp drive program. Believe it or not, NASA have a warp drive program. They're using Star Trek terminology and this is their sort of logo picture for it. We have um, here Hal Puthoff from the Institute of Advanced Study comes back on the scene. He talks about the, the warp drive program and about the concept of bending space-time and manipulating and distorting it. And um, his, his comment is this. The details which provide yet further support for the concept that reduced time interstellar travel, either by advanced extraterrestrial civilizations at present or by ourselves in the future, is not fundamentally constrained by physical principles. We cannot enter research any day, he's saying, trying to constrain the possibility of our discoveries by the laws of physics that were applied yesterday, because they are already outdated. It's now been discovered that superconductors are the key to the distance teleportation of matter. This is from the United States Department of Energy. The technique is to prepare a couple of quantum systems some distance apart. We take a digital measurement of the local system and transmit this to reconstitute a new quantum on the other side. It's actually the same as any of you sending a dig digital image from your computer to one of your other computers. It's simply changing it into a digital thing that can be transmitted through frequencies and sending it and reconstituting it where it appears. Except that we're not talking about images, we're talking about physical reality. Most significantly, continues the US Department of Energy, most significantly, by this means, even people could be transported by sending enough classical information. So, they're on the borders of it now. We now have a situation where we have, like in the medical race, we have a race between those people thinking in terms of anti-gravity aircraft and, and bending space-time to get spacecraft through situations, but we have this other stuff going on which actually says to us, by the time we get there we won't need machines to travel in at all. We'll be able to teleport anyway. Scientists at NASA, at Argonne National Labs, um, up there in Chicago, uh, all sorts of institutes around the world, at the Bose Institute of Calcutta and universities wherever, have all stated now that they have been able to link particle elements together, no matter how far apart they are, whether it's single atoms or trillions of atoms, they can link them together. So the sciences, all of these quantum sciences now, whether it's in Vienna, in Denmark, or here in the United States, they're all moving into the forefront Everything is being called nano, everything is being called quanta, 
quantum, how much. They make the point of the problem that we face, and it's just like the cancer and the DNA. It's a massive problem with a very small answer. Proxima Centauri is our nearest star. Our next star is 4.2 light years away. That's four and a half years travelling at the speed of light. The Voyager spacecraft left our atmosphere at 37,000 miles an hour. Even at that speed, it would take it 87,000 years to get to that star. There's no way we can do it. It's impossible. Everything dies, everything collapses, everything runs out, falls apart in the course of it, unless you take the space-time away. That's what they're working on now. That's what they're having to do. Nothing travels faster than light, they say, but we need to travel faster than light in order to make any headway. If travelling faster than light is impossible, the only alternative is to approach the problem from a different perspective. We must learn how to manipulate and distort space-time. The Ohio Aerospace Institute says that all of this is possible now because it's been recognised that, that space... It's just like any other matter. It has a form, it has a shape, it can be bent, it can be distorted. And how did they recognise that? Because when the white light <laughs> explosions occurred, and 44% suddenly disappeared, it was a blaze of light. But light has no weight. So what was happening here? Light has no weight, it simply illuminates space-time. Oh, maybe it's the space-time that weighs 44%. Yes, it was. Space-time has weight. It's physical matter. Among the forms of exotic matter they're now examining with great interest is something called stardust. Microscopic grains from way beyond our environment up there, way beyond the stratosphere, ionosphere, and these grains are found as particles, no more than six in every 100,000 other particles of dust up there. It's the oldest substance known to exist. It actually holds the reasoning for why we have life on this planet, and how it works, and how it originates. What does it test as? A very strange, unique form of silica that doesn't seem to be anything, except they know it has a metallic base, but it's not showing up in the tests. Sounds familiar? Sounds very familiar. This is a conglomeration of particles within which, somewhere in there, is a stardust particle in this minuscule thing. Uh, what they've ascertained and the way that they recognise it is that they say that they have discovered it on Earth. That's how they understand it. They found it in deep seabed sediments. They found it in Arctic ice. They found it in those parts of the Earth which they consider were the first and oldest of what we can get to today. And some of it, strangely enough, in, in asteroid and, and very, very ancient meteorite sites. Arizona being um, very famous in that regard. They say stardust will reveal more than we ever guessed we could know about life on this planet. Stardust is golden, they've used the phrase. They've got this spacecraft up there right now. It's called Stardust. It's hoping to bring back about 100 particles. It'll bring them back and they'll be tested at the Johnson Space Center uh, from January 2006. And how does it collect them? How does it distinguish six out of every 100,000 other dust particles when it's going through millions of thousands of them at a time. This device on the top there, this, this grid thing, is full of something called aerogel. Aerogel looks like nothing. It weighs absolutely nothing. There she is balancing it on her fingertips. Um, it can be penetrated by nothing. Not even heat can get through it. That Bunsen burner is having no effect on those wax crayons. Aerogel is absolutely and totally heat resistant. It will withstand particle and granular impacts of 60,000 odd miles an hour. Why is it called aerogel? Because it's made from air. 98% of that is air, nothing else at all. 2% they won't tell us. It's a secret, but wow, what a secret that is. Why have we always known that gold was valuable? Why have we always hoarded gold? We've done it for as long as we can think. From the 1840s, when the California gold rush began, I'm told by the World Gold Council that to that point in time, only 10% of all the gold ever mined up until today's date had been mined. 90% of all the gold ever mined to now has been done since the 1840s. Think of 
ancient Egypt. Think of Russia and its wonderful golden domes. Think of the way that gold was so visible throughout the whole of history. That was 10%. Where's the 90%? We pay fortunes to put a little bit on our wrist or our finger. Where's the rest? Well, we dig it up underground and we bring it up top. We clean it up. We melt it down. We turn it into gold bars and we bury it back under the ground again. A wonderful system. Nobody ever sees it. It underpins everything, but now they're selling it. Who are they selling it to? Interesting question. We have about 30 years of oil at best left in the world, if we're lucky. Coal is just about done for. I mean, everything is getting too expensive now. We don't really want to burn stuff and pollute the atmosphere. So alongside the drug companies, the oil companies are really feeling the pinch as well. So who's buying the materials? I have a theory that probably it's the oil and drug companies putting themselves in a position to become tomorrow's masters of the new source materials. Everything begins to link. You know, stardust is now the secret holder of the force of life. It's the origin of life. It's the giver of life. Well, so were monatomic elements. So were the ancients saying about the shamana and the mufkut. It was all the same thing. Every description of these substances was always the same. We think about the Bible story, we think about the how we can make monatomic elements now, we need electronic devices, we need fire, we need all sorts of things, but we need electricity. In one way or another, we need electricity, and this is the one bit of the equation that has to be got through very quickly, because this is our last remnant, we think, about electricity. How are we going to produce electricity to manufacture our fuel cells if we don't have the fossil fuels to have our power stations? We get electricity from its most natural source, which is around us all the time. What we need is a device that will attract electricity, that will store electricity, that will discharge electricity in a very controllable form, in enormous quantities. However, we need to do it. That's all the Ark of the Covenant ever did and all it ever was. If you look at the construction of the Ark of the Covenant, it is no more than a model for every capacitor made today, whether it's a capacitor for lighting up street lighting or whatever. An insulated, double-plated box with a positive and electric, uh, a negative node at the top. That's it, that's all it is. And you look at the description of the Ark of the Covenant in the Bible, which is given twice, you take every measurement, you manufacture it with the materials that it says in accordance with everything it tells you, and you have a 100,000 volt immediate electronic capacitor. You do what the Bible says and you place an Oma of the Shamana in it, golden part of the white powder, you place it in there, you've immediately got a superconductor. You've immediately got a device that sets up its own Meisner field, which will levitate, which will be able to travel on its own, which will be able to issue gamma rays or, or whatever you need it to do. A very, very powerful device. We have to go back to these very simple devices that simply pull it in and hold it and issue it. The Ark of the Covenant is not wrongly named. It's spelt with a K in the Bible because that was the Greek way of spelling it. In every other language it's spelt with a C and electronic arcing actually comes from that very same word. So everybody's now working on all of these things. NASA has developed its Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Project. That's what it calls it. What's the Breakthrough Propulsion Physics Project? It's how to get the stars by bending and manipulating space-time. That's what they're working on right now. Anti-gravity, that's the other thing. That's not necessarily just about spacecraft, that's about ordinary aircraft. Um, quite a lot in the press and on the internet, here from the UK Ministry of Defence and from the BBC, anti-gravity propulsion is coming out of the closet, says Defence Weekly. Well, to this end, British Aerospace um, over in Britain has embarked on Project Green Glow. Um, over here uh, at the top secret Phantom Works uh, in Seattle, Boeing technicians are working on Project Grasp. They're very, very similar. They're both looking at anti-gravity aircraft. Why do we need aircraft that can fall down? We want aircraft that just stay in their frequencies and go wherever we turn the knob to tell them to go. In fact, they don't need pilots, really. Just send them places. This um, picture here is British Aerospace's latest design um, for a new stealth aircraft. Why do we just have to have something that radar can't see when we can actually produce things that we can't see?
In fact, we can produce things that aren't even invisible. They're not in our time dimension. They've moved from our visible plane. Wouldn't it be wonderful if there was a stealth aircraft that simply left here and couldn't be seen by anybody because it wasn't there, because it was travelling in a different dimension and simply came back where we wanted it to be? Now, by the same token, on that basis, why couldn't ordinary aircraft, our passenger liners, travel in that same way? It doesn't have to be a bomber. It doesn't have to be that. You know, why can't we all be travelling in different parallel dimensions and getting to places in five seconds instead of it taking 11 hours every time I come over here? We are finding the place where the stardust, the monatomic elements, meet the stargate and will take us in to the world of other dimensions so that suddenly, as Putoff says, we can't apply the laws of physics anymore. We have a whole new set of rules that belong to worlds and realms that we knew nothing about until now. We get to that point and just about everything that was impossible becomes possible. Thank you. Thank you.